Hello and welcome back to the lab. Today on the bench is not really a repair project or anything like that, but I wanted to cover more about the topic of alignment, calibration, and how to get a cow lab spun up from zero. Uh, since I had to do that in my personal lab, uh, I didn't have access to any of the equipment at all, didn't know anybody was kind of working in a vacuum. Um, I was stuck diving down the rabbit hole myself. Now, I had a great time doing it, and I would do it again in a heartbeat because I had a ton of fun and learned an absolute metric ton while doing it. So don't mind the exercise at all, and I would do it again. But I figured I'd compile some of that knowledge into a video and hope it would benefit someone else. So first things first that I ran into was when I started, I was just acquiring some equipment from various auction sites because I was trying to get a lab spun up and off the ground. And um, the first couple of batches of equipment came in and everything was good. But I very quickly ran into some problems with the check-ins and the alignment. Um, at the time I'm talking about, the only new piece of equipment, or actually it was old, it wasn't even new at that time, it was way out of calibration, was this fluke meter that I had. Um, at that point in time, at least personally, this was the best meter I had access to. It's a three and a half digit meter, so it's not a slouch of a meter by any stretch of the imagination. Very rugged. I've had it for years, and I absolutely love it. It was the best thing I had, but for some of the stuff that I wanted to do, because I wanted wanted to outfit the bench with some analog equipment as well as some digital equipment. I'm still working on some of the digital equipment. I have a feeling I'll be working on that for quite some time yet, but wanted to get started with some of the analog equipment and... Anybody who's looked out on the internet knows there's a bunch of it out there of various states of repair, disrepair, restoration, and questionable measurements. The main problem is when you as the technician for your own lab receive that equipment, you don't know how it was stored, what state it's in, does it work? I can tell you most of the stuff that I got new or, I'm, I'm sorry, most of the stuff that I did not get new on the bench, it did not work <laughs> in the in the beginning. Some of it still needs work, <laughs> and there will be more videos coming out about that. But after you repair something, say a meter, say a scope or something like that, you've disturbed the alignment that's on that unit, and it needs to be realigned. Sometimes it needs to be drastically realigned. Uh, for instance... Take a um, 577. If you adjust the power supplies, you have to do the entire alignment process. It'll throw everything off. Is it still good as a measurement device with a bad alignment? Yes, it is. If I put, if I have a 576 or 577 and I put a transistor on it, it can tell me if the transistor's working. It can tell me if the transistor's shorted. It can tell me... I can compare two transistors to each other. Can I do quantitative measurements on that transistor. Yes, I can compare, say, yeah, I get curves, it's working, I can ballpark the gain. I can say this is a high gain, low gain transistor or something like that. Can I get qualitative measurements off of that transistor? Can I measure the gain exactly within the limits of the unit? No, I can't, because I don't know if the unit's performing to specification. Uh, it needs to be calibrated or calibrated and aligned, which gets me into the first topic. I've been using um, those terms float around a lot on the on the web, calibration, alignment, things like that, and I'm guilty of it as well. I have been using those interchangeably. Technically, they are not. A calibration is comparing an instrument to a known standard. So let's say I wanted to calibrate that DMM, and I had a resistor that I knew the value to very precisely. We'll get back to very precisely. That, that's going to be a common theme through this entire video. If I hook the meter up in the appropriate way, and I 
get the reading I'm expecting, I've now calibrated that meter. That meter is, has been calibrated. I've compared it to a known reference that I know is good, and the meter's given me the result I expect. And alignment is what I've been doing in the, in the, um, in the scopes. So doing the adjustments is aligning the meter to the, to the source, we'll say. So if you're looking to spin up a calibration lab, a couple of the big things are known, validated, working sources. That will be a going that will be a running theme throughout this entire thing. It throughout this entire video is known, validated, working sources. If you don't have known, validated, working sources, you can't align to them. So if I have a random square wave generator and I haven't validated that against a higher level instrument, I have no idea if it's outputting what it's supposed to. I get a picture on the screen. Is it right? That's the question. So a lot of the alignment procedures, and especially in the earlier videos of going through the, the PG-506, the TG-501, and the SG-503, those, those three units in particular, was strictly for making sure they were known, validated, working sources. So when I did the alignment process and went through all the effort to align the scopes, I knew the alignments were good because I checked the plugins and I knew, uh, for instance, take the PG-503. It has the, uh, calibrated, the calibrated square wave that comes out for the amplitude measurements. I validated each step with a meter that was, well, actually brand new at the time, um, but it was known, in spec, calibrated, and functioning correctly. I validated all of that with the DMM 7500 because I had it in a lab. But that's a pretty steep investment for somebody who's just getting started and wanting to do this type of work. So we're going to say that's probably not available. Now, do you need a DMM 7500 to get started? No. Can you get started with this? Eh, maybe. Um, you're going to be limited on accuracy and stability on a meter like this. Is that a great place to start? Absolutely. Um, now, this video is not sponsored by Keithley. There are reasons I bought that meter. If um, people would like to see a deeper dive into the DMM 6500 and 7510, let me know. And I'm more than happy to feature those again, especially now that I've gotten a lot of time on them. Uh, still absolutely love them. The 6500 is my daily bench driving meter. This is actually my daily field meter um, that I use out in the field. But I also work on some high energy stuff. So I'm, I'm a bit picky because uh, life and safety is involved. The next question is, what will you be aligning or calibrating? Um, the equipment you need to do a multimeter is completely different than the equipment you need to do an oscilloscope or the equipment you need to do a spectrum analyzer or an RF generator or something else, um, like a frequency counter. It's, it's completely different alignment gear. Now, some of the stuff is multipurpose. I do have feelers out and anybody who is watching, if you know of any, uh, fluke multi purpose calibrators or some other of the multi-purpose calibrators that need a home uh, working or not, uh, I would be interested. Shoot me an email or leave me in a comment below. I'd love to get some of those on the channel and also get them working in the lab. I have some of the older gear um, to do the same function. The modern stuff, they rolled it into, uh, they rolled three or four pieces of equipment into one unit and uh, those carry a pretty hefty price tag still today, um, even in the secondary market. So I have what I needed now. Some of the things that were driving the calibration. The main things you're looking for in alignment gear or calibration gear is ultimately stability. I don't care what the exact dial reading is on the front of this unit, as long as when I set it, comparing it to something else like the 7510, um, 
I can use this as a transfer standard because it's stable enough. And that's that's one of the main differences between the 6500 and the 7510 is the voltage reference in the two meters. The 6500 is far less stable, but it also has one less digit of accuracy. Um, so for instance, if I wanted to align this, I could use a 6500 to align the fluke because it has less digits. The, the um, 6500 is a six and a half digit meter. Blow this up so everybody can see this. Um, the fluke is a three and a half. So let's talk about sources a little bit since everything's getting close to warming up. Uh, warm up period is also um, very important, especially when doing an alignment, because lots of things drift with temperature. Um, a true cow lab, the environment is monitored, it's shielded, the power's filtered. They go to extreme lengths to get the stability and the noise out. So you're talking, uh, well, cell phones probably wouldn't even be allowed in to where the uh, more sensitive equipment is because it would disturb some of the um, measurements in progress. But the, um, the, build, uh, the room will be shielded. The power would definitely be filtered. All of it, not just a couple of them. Uh, one of the things I've done in this lab to uh, help that as much as I can, given that I don't have a true cow space yet, although I'd love to have one of those in the future, um, everything's on the same phase in the breaker panel. So all the electric that drives the bench is on the same ground, same phase, and there's uh, 80 amps in the wall right back there. But um, so there's four 20 amp breakers. Those four 20 amp breakers are on the same phase. So the line uh, voltage is all in sync with each other because it's all coming down the same off the same side of the panel. And it's coming off the same panel, too. I personally haven't run into any issues with ground loops yet, but that's not saying that's an impossibility. Um, I just haven't had that be a problem yet. I have a power supply back there, the Rigel. And that's hooked up to the meter up there. And we'll turn this on now that everything's kind of warmed up. Let's turn on the output. I set it to 6 volts. After zooming in on the Rigo, we can see it's set to uh, 6 volts. But it's, at, it's telling me it's putting out 5.998. Well, my meter's telling me it's outputting 5.99986. Now... Is this truly accurate? No, this isn't the highest accuracy. This this meter's this is not the highest accuracy. This meter's actually um, done, so or capable of. If I we'll clear the buffer. I shall change it. But if I do one, we'll do 15 power line cycles, and we'll turn the filter on. Leave auto zero on. And then we will clear the buffer again. And we'll go over here to the graph. So now as the graph builds, you'll notice that since I have the filter turned on plus the 15 power line cycles, the meter slowed way down in its reading. That's by design. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why I like the 6510 and the 7510. Both of, both of them are very, very fast meters. My other fluke meter, the 8505, this guy who I've added to the bench and started his warm-up, is um, also quite accurate for doing an alignment, but it's very slow. So measurement-wise, this guy takes a reading at its highest accuracy about once a minute. So it's about 50 seconds per reading. Fantastic meter. It's just when you're dialing a knob dialing it in with a 50 second interval is tedious at best. <laughs> um, at the time, it's what people were, it's all we had. So it's what we had to deal with. But as we can see, let's see if we can, that's only got 30 readings, but it's got a and we're running a standard deviation of 32 microvolts, 
which to be honest is actually pretty impressive for that Rigel power supply. So <laughs> I expected that to be worse. But we'll see what happens with some transients as we let it run. So one of the main differences between the Rigel power supply and this EDC power supply is this EDC power supply is much more precise. You can tell by the amount of resolution it has, uh, which also means it's much more stable. That's the main, that's other than the additional digit, that's the main difference between the, 70, uh, the 7510 and the 6500. The 7510 has a much more stable reference. It also requires a far longer warm-up time. To get to rated accuracy on a 6500, it's a 30-minute warm-up time. To get to rated accuracy on a 7510, it's an hour and a half. And the warm-up time is so important in the 7510 there's actually a message on the meter that pops up to tell you when it's done. Uh, so you turn it on, you walk away, you get coffee, you get prepped for whatever you need to measure, and it gets um, you get done. So, but back to this is a very deep rabbit hole. I can talk for days on this. So if if anybody has any questions, leave them in the comments below. And um, this is this video is actually being created from a um some user uh some viewer questions so if there's enough interest in the topic i'll make a video on it at the end of the day stability is the key to whatever it is voltage current reference uh frequency resistance stability is the key now um resistance and temperature swing wildly that's part of the reasons for the warm ups so because as resistors warm up, their resistance will go up, they'll go down. Um, anybody can do this experiment with a meter with a decent amount of resolution and a, and a hot air station. So just put a resistor on ohms and make it hot and watch what happens. Also, as you go up in decimal places, the stability gets more important. Because it doesn't do you any good if you're taking a measurement with an 8.5, 10.5, 12.5. We don't have those. We stop at 8.5, but 12.5 but digit meter. But the reference is only good for 2.5 digits. The back end of the meter is just going to be noise. It's just going to be moving around, and it's not going to work too well. To put this in its most sensitive range, we go to VDC. And we actually need to be on the 10 volt range. Because it can only get to its... Um, highest range on 10 volts and then we do filter and averaging where's average ah average okay filter and average is turned on highest reading you guys will see how slow this is We'll feed it some signal out of the EDC. This might not be the stablest thing in the world. It may not be 100% warmed up yet. Um, let's see. Volts. Input. Click that to positive. Oh. Why is this irritated? It says error zero. VDC. Oh, no, wait, that's amps DC. Sorry, I want VDC. Oops. Range 10. Uh, filter and average. Helps if I put the meter in the right mode. There we go. That looks better. I should be able to get it to 10. Now, don't worry about this point one. It's actually zero. It's just not showing up correctly. But you can see how slow this updates. Now, even though it updates, we have one, two, three, four, five. We have six digits of resolution on here. So 
you actually get an extra digit on the 10-volt range with filtering and averaging enabled. This is usually an exponent digit. Um, only in this mode is this actually a measuring digit. So, And we can see this is moving around still too. Usually for calibration labs, they will turn the... Um, they'll turn the device on, and then um, it'll just stay on. It'll stay warmed up. Nobody will change it. it. They don't get shut down much, and they don't move much, and the, the environmentals are monitored and controlled very tightly. Um, in a full-on cow lab, the temperature of the room doesn't move more than, I think it's 0.5 degrees in an hour is one of the specifications. So... They don't even like to thermal shock the equipment with the air con going up and down um, because that changes uh, the readings uh, measurably, um, especially with gear that that's, that's that sensitive. Uh, that being said, I'm sure there is a 3458A in my future, but not yet. So using the 6500 and a stable reference... I was able to calibrate or align these little three and a half inch, or three and a half inch, three and a half digit meters. So I had a bunch of these to line up, and I was picking them up relatively inexpensively. Um, but they were coming in, and they were actually all over the map. These do not hold their alignment well, so unless you know somebody that has the gear needed to align one of these or not, these should not be trusted when you get them. Uh, they're wonderful units. They do work. They do work fantastically once they're fixed up and aligned. But all of them that I had needed alignment. Okay. Well, having established that stability was important, now how do we get started? I had to start somewhere. And I was in a vacuum. There wasn't uh, anything around me, at least that I knew of. So for me, that was here. Uh, in the beginning, my basic DC, AC, ohms, and current accuracy was that unit right there, the 6500. So for doing the three and a half digit multimeters and things like that, that was fine because I have way more than three and a half digits. I have the stability I need. Everything is good. Um, however, that didn't let me work on the flukes or the EDC. Uh, if you look back through the video catalog, I think it's one of the one of the very, very early videos that I did when I was working on these, um, when I was working on the DMM 502As, I needed an AC stable AC standard, and I didn't have one. So I poked around, saw what I could f find, and one came up broken. It was a, it was a Fluke 5200A. Um, if you're looking to acquire one of those, know that the 5200A only goes up to 100 volts unless you get the, the um, complementary 10X amplifier uh, this particular unit did come with both and the cable to connect them. However, it did come broken. It was, um, it was totally burned up. Didn't know if it was going to be fixable or not, but I sent some money into the uh, void that is the internet, and one showed up at my door. Uh, had a real nice Air Force uh, shipping container for the uh, for the two units. I still have that in the in the garage. It's um, I do plan on using that somewhere. It's a it's a road ready impact rated 19 inch rack space. Not 100 percent sure what I'm going to do with it yet, but uh, that is going to get used for something. So I got that fixed up, and then, well, let me let me start back at the beginning. The DMM 6500 was base accuracy. The Rigel 1104 was I got a 100 megahertz scope. This was calibrated from the factory, so was the 6500, and that was my that established me for wave shape, 
a little bit of rise time, some some timing. The the um, the time base on this scope is good, but not alignment good. Um, I needed something a little tighter than that, but this at least get me got me started um, because now I had something that could show me wave shape, and I had something that could measure that was in cal. I knew was right, and I had a pl and I had a foundation to build. The next problem I had to solve was I needed timing down. And especially because I was doing scope alignments, timing was very, very critical. So I got this frequency counter, but now I have a frequency counter in the lab, but I don't know if it's in Cal. I don't know how good it is. This does not have the high stability time base. Uh, so I have something that can measure frequency, but its accuracy, at least for an alignment, is lacking. So I can get in the ballpark, but I need to align. So the next thing up on the list that I need to align that's coming into the lab is I need to align the the uh, 106. I need to align the, the 184. I need to align the 191. Um, the 184 needs some very precise 10 megahertz alignments. So I've got a problem because I have a frequency counter that can be used to align the 10 megahertz, but I have a question about its accuracy. Well, fortunately, this particular frequency counter has a 10 megahertz input on it, and any frequency counter with enough digits and a 10 megahertz input will be fine for this. And my first GPSDO to the rescue. The GPSDOs locked me to the satellites to at, ex at, at an acceptable accuracy for doing a scope alignment. Now, always keep in mind when I'm doing the scope alignments on the channel and things like that, the target is 3%. Given that the GPSDOs are playing, are, are shifting in the microhertz when I'm doing alignments at 3%, now to align the gear that aligns the scopes, I needed to be tighter than 3% to make sure I could hit the 3% for the scopes. So, um, but the frequency counter plus the GPSDO now I've got a base, a foundation built of volts, amps, ohms, wave shape, and timing. So now I can start working on the actual gear, and I and I have a good enough accuracy that I can start working on the on the actual gear to align the scopes. First up is the 106. That's one of the units that I rebuilt. This is very early in the channel, too. I believe there's a video out there on this one. Yeah, there is a video out there on this one. The 106, I could get I could get the frequency dialed in. I could get the wave shape right uh, because the main output doesn't have a rise, doesn't have that fast of a rise time. However, I was limited at that point in time because I couldn't check the fast rise inputs and uh, the fast rise and fall times. So the these two connectors right here, I couldn't really check these out um, because I didn't have a scope fast enough to do it. So we're still trying to get to the point where I can actually align a scope and get started. At this point, we've got the base gear, but I've got, I can align this output to where this is now useful. Everything's repaired. I'm accurate enough on the, um, amplitudes and things like that because of the DMM. And I can go from there. There will be a solution to these that come into play later, but I will get to that. Next piece of gear that found its way into the repair was the 184. Um, this gave me my first time marks. Um, not as accurate as the TG501. The This has an ovenized crystal in it for its main reference, so the absolute frequency fluctuates as the crystal's heating and cooling. So you can you can tell if you have a sensitive enough frequency counter that um, uh, you'll see as the as the oven warms up, the frequency will rise. As the crystal cools off, the frequency will come back down. So it's constantly doing this. And when you're doing the alignment of the 184, it's a moving target. So it's not like it's not like the TG501 where it's like hit it, warm it up, adjust it, done. This is constantly bouncing up and down on you as you're trying to do the adjustment. Um, the trick is to get it to average. 10 megahertz. Now, on my particular unit, given the components that are in it, and especially because we're talking about an ovenized oscillator, mine was plus minus 25 hertz both sides. So my 10 megahertz aver average was 
minus 25, plus 25, and I and I was able to hit that really, really nice. So that got the timing all set, but because of the timing, I um, and I could adjust the wave shape based on the Rigel. So I have the scope to do the wave shape, and I have the frequency counter to do the timing. Uh, and then I have the meter to check the power supplies, things like that, to make sure everything's in spec. So that gets him up and running, and we can use that. Now, I was unable to check the 5, nanos or the five nanoseconds and 2 nanoseconds at this moment due to the fact that my Rigel only goes to 100 megahertz. So I have some signals in the lab, especially the 1 nanosecond time markers out of a TG501, that... The Rigel can't even trigger on because a one nanosecond signal is a one gigahertz signal. So it's it's quite fast for the Rigel and um, even gives some of my faster scopes in the lab some struggles. Obviously not the ones that are made for it, but at this point in time, those were not available yet. So I, I'm still gearing up. I, I'm, I have a lot of things that aren't available. Next up is the 191. So this is a older version of a SG503. If you can fix a 191, you can fix a 503. The only thing that's weird about a 503 is the key parameter to both of those is the um, not even frequency stability because you can reference you can crash that against a um, frequency counter and just double check it. It's the flatness of the amplitude as you wind up frequency. Um, the absolute amplitude, when I set it to do an, an alignment, I don't even necessarily care. An alignment tells me to, do, to make six divisions of display. It doesn't tell me put 50 millivolts into the, into the scope. It says make six divisions. So you adjust the knob for six divisions, wind the frequency up. The important part about the device is this amplitude stays flat i.e. the same level, um, as you wind the frequency up. So that's what the superpower of the 191 and the SG503 is. Not the absolute accuracy or anything like that. Actually, their uh, they're clocks and the absolute accuracy is kind of abysmal um, spec-wise. But it's, um, it's the flatness that's important. Now, the 191 doesn't need anything special. To do the alignment on the SG503 to get the absolute dial accuracy correct, you need the special cable. It's a, it's a proprietary Tektronics cable. It's stamped on the front of the unit. It is the 12-0482-00. Um, I have one in the lab only because I did the alignment on mine. You do not need the cable to do a scope a scope calibration. You just need to make sure it's flat and it has frequency. Uh, the the frequency is in the ballpark. So um, don't stress about not having the special cable too much unless you're going to try to find try to set the dial accuracy and really check in the unit. The other thing that's very important about an SG503 is when this knob is all the way down at the bottom. Actually, this is the bad one. It's not supposed to... I need to adjust this one. Here's the one we did together. You'll notice, as you turn this dial down, it stops at 0 0.5. If you'll note here, it's... If, if you look at the spec sheet, it's 0 0.5 volts peak-to-peak to 5.5 peak to .5 volts peak-to-peak. -peak. This does not go all the way to 0, and it doesn't go below half a volt. This one is going all the way to zero. This has been misaligned. I need to fix this. This one is the one that I've already aligned on the channel. The other thing that's very important if you're doing a check-in of the SG503 is unless absolutely necessary, do not adjust the coils or the capacitors in the oscillator section. That oscillator section is very harmonically rich. There's a lot of things going on in there. And if it's working, don't, and, and it's meeting specification, don't tweak that section. Um, you can cause, if you tweak the low end, you can cause problems at the high end. If you tweak the high end, you can cause harmonics problems at the, harmonic problems at the low end. 
Um, it's a, it's it's very very interconnected and really needs a spectrum analyzer to do correctly. Now for doing a scope alignment, uh, we get back to a PG506. One of the things that's really cool about this guy is it has very accurate square wave amplitudes for checking in the attenuator section of a scope. Um, but when you do the alignment and the calibration on this, you check that you check this dial accuracy with a DMM. So um, to check one of these in the lab, especially when you're just getting started and building up this equipment, all you need to check this in is a DMM and a moderately sp moderate speed um, uh, scope. Obviously, I checked this. In, I I checked this in on the Rigel, so not too bad. The important part is you'll also notice this has fast rise and fall inputs. Make sure you use the right jack. I got that wrong a few times. Not in the videos, but before I started shooting with the camera. It's plus one volt to ground is the fast fall. Minus one volt to ground is the fast rise. So... Make sure you're using the right jack for the fast rise, fast fall. It's easy to get those confused. Um, this particular one is not an A model. Uh, it does not have the the fall time on the high amplitude generator is a little weird. Uh, I've gotten a lot of questions too why I switched to the 106 when I use this next piece of equipment that I'm going to show you. And that is because this doesn't have enough drive current to drive the tunnel diode pulser. Okay, because we still have the challenge of checking in the um, fast edges in the lab, I had to get a tunnel diode pulser. So this will this allows me to do the high frequency calibrations on the scopes or alignments. Sorry, on the uh, scopes and the fast edges. This was checked in with a uh, 7103, which is a one gigahertz scope. So I knew. I couldn't check this for over one gigahertz, but I knew the rise time on this on uh, this tunnel diode pulser was, um, or some of it I haven't even opened it up, was um, good enough to do at least everything in the 400 series and everything in the 7000 series that I have in the lab. But this was the last piece. So with the PG506, the SG503, the TG501, or the 106, the 184, and the 181, and the tunnel diode pulser. That's everything I needed to be able to do an alignment up to a 475. Couldn't do a 485 because I didn't have an SG504 because the uh, bandwidth was still is still a li is a little much for a SG503 for a 485. I know that's a lot of numbers, and all of those plugins could be checked in with the Rigol and the DMM. So the DMM, the Rigol, then you check in the calibration units. Ultimately got one validated with equipment that I didn't have at the time. And um, I was able to then start aligning the scopes. Uh, not the 7000 series yet, but at least get into the 400 series. So do a 465, do a couple of those. Um, I haven't done a 475 yet, but I just got uh, a bunch of them to work on, so that those videos will be coming. But that sets it up for the scope. So I also needed some accuracy, or I also needed to do some meters too. So I'm I'm good to f I'm good to the four. Well, let me finish the scopes first. I'm good to the 400 series. There's one more piece I need to do the 7000 series. All right, so that gets us to the 400 series. Aside for some miscellaneous attenuators and stuff like that, everything's good to go. But let's say we wanted to take on a bit more and do some 7000 series. Well, for that, we need to add a hard plug-in extender, uh, specifically the hard one. Um, 
it's not necess- necessary per se. However, uh, doing a time base without it is an absolute disaster. So, yes, they can be expensive. Um, sometimes they can be ludicrously expensive for what they are. Um, also, certain adjustments do need you to tap into these cables. So, it is, unfortunately, somewhat necessary. All it is is a circuit board with some BNCs on it. It can be made. Um, but I have one of the hard hard units, and um, there's the number for anybody who wants to look it up. Um, I can all... You can only be the judge on if it's worth it or not. I can't. Um, the other thing you're going to need for 7000 series plugins is one of the, or two of the signal standardizers and calibrators. Um, this is a proprietary fixture for the 7K series. I'll be going into detail on these here in the next video. Um, you don't need it per se, but it does make make it a lot easier to do the 7000 series and there's some limitations if you don't use one so i'll go into that here in a little bit there is three of them there's a dash zero zero dash zero one and dash zero two look for the dash zero one or the dash zero two the dash zero one is the most versatile um, the dash zero two is for the one gigahertz so it goes up to the uh, 710 three and four, uh, this will do a um, 7904A, I believe. Um, I don't know why, because I haven't dug into it too much yet, but the uh, 7854 Cal calls for a dash zero one and a dash zero two. We will find out about that when we get into that one. Um, I will be doing a 7854, but uh, we'll figure out why it needs both. But that actually gets us to the end of being able to do scopes. So the um, that can do everything in the in the 400 series. Um, if you get the appropriate adapters, it can probably do things down in the 500 series as well. Um, I haven't done much in the 500 series, so I can't say that for certain. But it definitely has the right signals. Um, the trick is making sure. All of that gear is checked in, working 100%, no exceptions, and making sure it all meets spec before you do an alignment. Because if the alignment of the, if the calibrator's out, the alignment's going to be out, the scope's not going to work right, and it's going to be, um, it's going to be frustrating. Uh, now in the lab, I have the DSA 602, which can actually self-calibrate, and that's a wonderful feature if you can pick up one of those due to the fact that I can now do the validation on the tunnel diode pulsers and things like that up to a one gigahertz, which I can then use to calibrate things that are slower than one gigahertz. Um, I do have a uh, 284, which are not aligned yet because I'm still working on building up to the alignment to being able to align those, um, which I mentioned in a couple of videos. But they, um, they're fast. They got some, uh, they got some pretty up there specs when it comes time to align them. But getting back into getting into meters now, uh, I also had some DMMs come in, and I will talk about why I ended up with all this uh, gear towards the end of the video. So if you're curious, um, we'll get into the whys of some of this. Um, the short answer is cost, but I'll get into some of the costs that I was quoted. Now, my prices are wrong because that was a while ago. But um, to align some meters, I needed to get some very stable sources, both DC and AC. Uh, resistance, I wasn't too worried about because I could cross-check that with the 6500 or the 7510. And I could do resistance that way, at least on the short term. I do want to get some actual alignment class resistors in the lab, but uh, that's been a cost issue as to why I don't have those yet. But a uh, quick four-wire measurement on a resistance box gets me where I need to go, at least in the short term. Um, the trick with DC and AC is stability. DC, obviously, is just stability at DC. 
and overall accuracy doesn't necessarily matter because I can use the 7510, set the dial to what I need it, and then it doesn't matter what these knobs are set to. That's what I'm getting at the end of the probes, which is the important part. I can hook those up to the meter under test and do the adjustment as possible uh, using the 7510 as a transfer standard. That's why I plan on, um, or that's why I am keeping the alignment up with that at uh, Keithley and having them do the factory alignment on that. Also, with that being the best meter in the lab, none of my standards here are good enough to align a 7510. I can't do it. So I have to send that out to people who have far more expensive gear than I do. And um, to put that into perspective, uh, Dave Jones did a video. I will link it in the description below uh, for people who are more interested in alignments and thing, or, uh, mobile calibration labs and things like that, where he toured a, I think it was Keysight, one of their mobile cal labs in Australia. And if I remember correctly, it was $2.5 million worth of gear. And that was just the gear. That wasn't the text to drive the gear. So it was like $2.3, $2.5 million worth of gear to do what they need to align. So much higher in gear than I've got. These are hiding in one of the corners of the lab. Um, this is my 5200A. I did a previous video on this as the negative power rail burned down. Um, its claim to fame is it has a very stable clock and it also has a very stable output for AC voltage and where where this is needed for the um, for the meter calibration is this needs to put out pretty clean sine waves um, up to one megahertz so this does a um, some of the AC meters will have you calibrate at a certain frequency and then readjust and do some other calibrations at a higher frequency and I haven't found um, I haven't found much with its stability and frequency range getting down in the hundreds of hertz up to the up to one megahertz uh, with the stability that's needed because this also talks to its associated amplifier and this is the big guy I mean just to give you an idea power pack for the camera. Uh, about how much no joke this is. Twelve hundred volts RMS. That's the other problem with doing meters. Is if you're going to calibrate a meter, usually you need signal sources that go up to a thousand volts. Uh, you need signal sources that go up to a thousand volts, both AC and DC. Um, now, most of my good meters in the lab, they top out at 750, mega, uh, 750 volts AC. However, you need to be able to check that. So you have to be able to feed it 750 volts AC at 1 megahertz, which is kind of crazy just that we're talking about 750 volts AC at a megahertz. So this, this guy, this 5205A, this is no joke. Uh, this thing puts out fatal amounts of power. This thing can light somebody up. This thing could kill you, especially if you open this thing up. This thing's nasty enough between the um, uh, positive voltage rail and the negative voltage rail. There's 600 volts DC. This thing outputs fi up to 1,500 volts AC. Uh, one of the things that's actually kind of cool about this is you can use it standalone uh, by putting a signal into the input. And it's a fixed amplifier. Whatever you put into the input comes out the um, output. And uh, these are loud. Like, just to give you guys an idea. I don't know if you can hear the hear the change. But, uh, and, I mean, it's, it's angry. It lets you know. Um, also, these do, yeah, warm-up time. It's in warm-up, so... And I do have the remote control cable to go from the 5200 to the 5205. So this is a full AC alignment setup. This is what I use to do meters. Um, but it is... This is no joke. Um, 
this is actually what I'm using currently for DC. Uh, it's in a little bit better shape. This is my 343A. Um, this is what I use for the DC side of things. I do want to get the, the EDC that's up on the bench um, repaired and aligned and, and fixed up. Um, I'm having a very hard time getting documentation on that one. The EDC is, e is easy to find documentation on. The Galvo that's in it, the galvanometer, um, nothing. Uh, I've asked, asked the internet, and I received crickets. So, and all this stuff is, uh, it's dial a voltage, and it's just uh, their, their claim to fame is stability. Now, this one for AC is stability and frequency accuracy. To do the Tektronix DMMs, you need DC, AC, and ohms. Um, and that's it. They, even though they have a current range, you don't actually calibrate the current range. I'm guessing that gets aligned when you do the um, DC because it's probably using just a shunt resistor. But um, those three units plus a decent resistor is really all I need. And a 7500 and, a, and the 7510 is really all I need to calibrate. Um, even up to like five and a half digit meters, I could do that easily with the 75. 10 because I have two more digits of accuracy calibrating or aligning a six and a half digit meter with a six and a half digit meter eh, that's starting to get shaky uh, you could um, do a if you had a 6500 and you were aligning a five and a half digit multimeter um, that's that's doable um, bearing in mind the accuracy of both um, and making sure you're not falling into a uh, uh, some accuracy stacking that would be doable but you can't you can't calibrate a the same class of meter with the same class of meter so you can't calibrate well you can attempt to calibrate a six and a half with a six and a half and get okay results but you cannot be guaranteed of the accuracy of your results when you're done the alignment absolute accuracy so the trick to setting up a cow lab from zero is getting a good foundation, whatever that might be, for whatever unit you need to align. And then the order of repairing the devices is very important. So I had to get the uh, calibrators fixed before I could do the scopes. Then I was into the scopes and everything like that. So build the foundation, build the devices in the correct order, and eventually you'll start comparing things to each other and it'll just it'll just build up from there but the reason as to why all of this started and ended up happening is really it boils down to cost uh, I have had people ask me if I'll align 400 uh, 465s for them I have always pointed those individuals to the videos and said here's how you can do an alignment on a 465 However, you would have to, I would have to charge way more than Tektronix does the last time I got a 465 quoted. Um, the last time I got a 465 quoted, they would have aligned a 465 for me for $100. Now, this turns out to be a deal that I believe they give to hobbyists to keep the scopes alive. The problem is, that's the alignment cost, that's not the repair cost. So... One of the things that I ran into and why the calibration lab exists is I had a random unknown scope from eBay. I could have sent it over to tech and gotten a line for $100 for a 465. But I didn't know if it worked. And to be perfectly honest, none of them did. They all needed some form of repair work um, and things like that. The attenuators needed to be cleaned. Switches needed to be serviced. Um, none of them were ready for a alignment lab. Uh, when I got them personally, actually none of this equipment was ready for an alignment lab when I got it. When I got it personally, all of it needed something. So that was one thing: is having the alignment devices under my control. I could check, start checking in the scope, find out there's problems with it, fix those problems, continue checking in the scope, wash, rinse, repeat until I had a fully functioning inspect scope. Now this is true for the 465. I asked them because I didn't have the tunnel diode pulser and I didn't have a few other things 
in the lab that I needed to do a 485 for me. I was quoted $850 to align a 485. You could almost get half of the cowl equipment for that price. If you're patient, you can get all of the cowl equipment for under that price. So, um, obviously, that was a, eh, we're not going to do that. Um, I then started working on the 7000 series. And this is where things went a little off the rails. To do a 7000 series scope, you have a vertical plug-in. You have a, so at bare minimum, to fully align a 7000 series scope, you have to start with the frame. You have to use the special plugins. You then have to align the vertical and the horizontal. So at bare minimum, there's three alignment procedures that you have to do on a, on a 7000 series scope. I was quoted $800 for each one. So $2,400 to align. Actually, it's worse than that. Two, two vertical plug-ins. So to fully align a 7603, it was one frame, two verticals, one time base. $3,200 to align the scope. And that's assuming all the plugins were fixed, repaired, working, and ready for an alignment. Looking at those prices at that cost with as many plugins as I had to do <laughs> and as many scopes as I have in the lab, because I kind of fell down the um, rabbit hole of the 7000 series pretty far. It made sense for me to bring it in house and do it myself. So that is why um, I did choose to go that route and I did buy um, I did buy all the plugins and everything that I needed. That's also why I ended up with the rubidium standard here in the lab is because I wanted to get the timing and, and everything as tight as humanly possible so I could just make the best measurements I could. All of this is for measurement quality. That, that's really all, that, all this is, is making the unit perform to factory spec so I can take good measurements with it. That, that's it. And that doesn't even account any of the alignments um, for the curve tracers or anything like that that I've done. Now, I do plan on, this is for future projects, given that uh, life is about to stabilize for me a little bit, as you guys may have seen from one of the previous videos. It got a little crazy. Um, I do plan on doing an alignment on my spectrum analyzers. I plan on doing an alignment on my RF signal generator. So we're going to have some pretty fast, um, that there's some, there's some really cool stuff coming and I'm going to have to get into RF power meters and we're going to have to, I mean, we're going to go down a rabbit hole pretty far. So all that stuff is on the way and we're going to do some fast signals too. I mean, just doing the 284, we get into the five gigahertz range where we're playing on, playing with, with, uh, really fast edge, uh, square waves. So, uh, one of the other important tools, especially when doing a meter alignment is I needed a current source. Uh, that was one of the reasons for the 2450 is it gives, it gave me an accurate current source to at least validate the, um, Tektronics meters that they were working with in spec, um, which is fine. And it can, and it can actually be turned into a mode for a current source. Uh, I do, pl I do ultimately plan on getting a 2470, which is the 1100 volt unit and the 2461 as well, uh, which is the high current model. So I do plan on getting the other two, uh, source, source measure units and a few, uh, and a few more things to add to the lab. Uh, one of the other projects that is going to be coming up very soon is I've been getting a lot of requests for, hey, I have a function generator. Can I align a scope? You know, with a 3% target and a good clock, which we have on the either the GPSDO or the Rubidium, I think you could probably do it. I'm, 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 I'm actually hopeful. So... Um, here in the near future, we have a pile, literally a pile of 475s that just got into the lab from a from a viewer. He asked if I was willing to 
prepare some for him, and um, we had a way to make sure they would get here without damage. So uh, they are here, and I will be starting to working on those soon. But one of those I really would like to see if I get a function generator, because our tolerance is only 3% on a 400 series scope, even a 7,000 series scope, it's 3%. Um, we should be able to do a pretty good job. Now, you will not be able to fully check in the attenuators with a function generator because you won't have the high output. Um, a lot of function generators cannot generate a, a 100 volt square wave, for instance. So checking some of the highest attenuation levels, uh, it's going to struggle with the function generator. But we should be able to tune the, we'll definitely be able to tune the low frequency compensation should be able to get medium into the high frequency compensation. Um, it's been suggested that uh, the Leo pulse, Pulsar might work for the high frequency compensation. We'll try it. Um, I, I would like to get a Leo on the DSA and the um, 11801C, see what they look like, especially on the C. If I, if I could get one of the fast sampling units on the 11801, I could really take a look at the square wave coming off of the or take take a look at the pulse coming off of the Leo Leo pulser, but um, so we'll see what we can do. Um, there are some there are some places where I'm sure it's going to get interesting. It's going to get real interesting real fast uh, doing a scope calibration or scope alignment with a uh, function generator. But I do plan on running the experiment, um, and that was one of the reasons why I was looking at the. Siglent unit that I was looking at. I was also looking at the Rigel unit. Uh, there's a couple of Rigel units that I'm thinking about, and I may even do it twice. I, I may, uh, and let me know what you guys want to see. I mean, if you want me to run the experiment with a slow function generator, not just say, hey, don't, don't worry about uh, rise times. Just grab one, and we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Um, worst case scenario. Um, I have to realign it with the gear that's it's designed for. So, um, but yeah, I'm 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 really interested to do, to to doing the alignment and then checking it and seeing um, where it's going to have some where it's going to have problems. Okay, I'm kind of impressed with the Rigel power supply. It has a standard deviation of 116 microvolts. It's been running the entire time I've been filming this. So, I just want to show you guys the results. This is with 1,262 readings. Everything warmed up at 6 volts. So depending on the meter accuracy you were going for, you could probably even use a DPA32A to do some 3.5-digit alignments if you absolutely needed it. I would confirm it with a higher accuracy meter, though. But I'm actually kind of impressed. Well, thanks for stopping by the lab. And if anybody has any questions or comments, definitely leave them in the comment section below. I will see everybody there, and I hope this cleared up a few things, but if anybody would like me to go even deeper into this topic, uh, please let me know, and I'm more than happy to make some more videos on it. And with that, I will see everybody in the next video.